The Dassault Mirage 3 Series are a second generation single seat, single engine fighter aircraft of French origin. It emerged out of a 1953 specification from the French government for a lightweight all weather interceptor with a top speed of Mach 1.3 in level flight. After examining various designs from captured German origins, a tailless delta configuration was adopted. However, several limitations were identified. The lack of a horizontal stabilizer meant that a long takeoff run and high landing speed were required. The delta wing itself limits maneuverability and causes buffeting at low altitude due to the large wing area and resulting low wing loading. However, the delta wing is simple, easily built and robust platform, capable of high speed in a straight line and with plenty of space in the wing for fuel storage. The starting point was the first generation Mystere, which was simply modified into the delta wing configuration and did not include an afterburning engine. It first flew on the 25th of June 1955 and was renamed the Mirage 1. In late 1955, the prototype attained the required speed of Mach 1.3 in level flight. However, the small size of the Mirage 1 restricted its armament to a single air-to-air -air missile, which was deemed unsatisfactory and subsequently scrapped. An enlarged version, the Mirage 2, remained unbuilt and was ultimately bypassed for a more ambitious design that was 30% heavier than the Mirage 1 and was powered by the new Snecma Atar afterburning turbojet, which developed a thrust of 43.2 kilonewtons. It's an actual flow turbojet, which was derived from the German World War II BMW 018 design, itself a larger version of the famous BMW 003 jet engine. The Mirage 3 was among one of the new planes which incorporated the newly discovered transonic area rule. This aerodynamic principle requires changes to an aircraft's cross section to be made as gradual as possible resulting in what's known as the WASP waste configuration of many supersonic jets. The prototype Mirage 3 flew on the 17th of November 1956, and after a successful test flight regime over the course of a year, an order for 10 pre-production Mirage 3A fighters was placed with an uprated ATAR 09B. The first production Mirage 3A flew in May 1958, and eventually achieved Mach 2.2, becoming the first European aircraft to exceed Mach 2 in level flight. At around this time, the Royal Australian Air Force was looking for a replacement for its F-86 Sabre fleet and had a Mirage fitted with the Rolls-Royce Avon 67, which was designated the Mirage 3.0, O for Aussie, or Aussie, but the Avon power plant was not adopted primarily due to the additional expense. The Australian government decided that the RAAF would deploy the Mirage 3E multi-role strike variant, assembled in Australia by the government aircraft factories from Australian-made components. The designation of Mirage 3O was retained for this variant, even though the ATAR engine was used. The major difference, however, between the 3E and the 3O was the avionics installed. Dassault produced the first two sample 3O aircraft, with the first flying in March 1963. The remaining order of 98 aircraft and an additional 16 two-seat training versions were completed in Australia and served until the introduction of the FA-18 Hornets in 1986. The last example being retired from service in 1988, and 50 surviving examples were sold to Pakistan in 1990. The aircraft was known affectionately by its RAAF pilots as the French Lady and by all accounts was a sheer delight to fly. However, make no mistake, as if you didn't treat her with respect, she would punish you, as the statistics show all too well. During the 24 years of Australian service, 43 aircraft were lost and 14 pilots were killed. The Mirage 3O was armed with twin 30mm cannon, fitted in the belly with the gun ports being located under the air intakes. It was fitted with a Thompson CSF air intercept radar, which was mated to the radar-guided Matra R530 missile mounted on the center line pylon. The outboard pylon was intended to carry an AIM-9B Sidewinder air-to-air -air missile. 
which was later replaced by the Matra R550 Magic missile, both of which are heat-seeking close-range missiles. There are a few minor issues with the kit. Firstly, there are some fit issues, which required considerable trimming and filling, in particular around the nose cone, the midsection of the air intakes, and the rear of the aircraft. These were all easily fixed, but did take considerable amount of time. So if you're looking for a quick build, this is not really one of those. The quality of some of the rivet detail was lacking in some parts, being washed out in places and further removed by the filling and trimming process. This required a complete re-drilling of all the rivets, but the final outcome is well worth it. And if you enjoy that kind of thing, as I do, then it's a fun build. The one serious shortfall of the kit, however, are some of the decals. Printed by Cartograph, they are generally great, but in some areas they were too long and in others they fell short, which was slightly annoying, but not insurmountable. It is unfortunate though, that all the decals for the missiles were omitted from the decal sheets altogether. So as you can see, they are quite plain. These decals do appear in the previous itinerary boxing of the Mirage, so they do exist and are certainly referred to in the instructions. When attempting a bare metal finish, it is very important to get the undercoat right, as any imperfections will likely be visible with this finish, compared to a normal camouflage scheme. The first step is to ensure that the plastic has been sanded down with ultra-fine sandpaper and or polishing compound. It is also critical that the paint finish is highly glossy, and many of the normal undercoat products may not be suitable as some have the potential to lay down a slight texture or are simply not sufficiently glossy. For this example, however, I'm using the Gloss Black Base by Alclat. Unfortunately, I had to scrap the first coat due to an error and start again, and failed to realise that the putty along the spine of the plane was damaged slightly by the process, and thus the spine of the plane is slightly suboptimal. When applying the undercoat, ensure that the model is clean and free of any dust and first apply a thin coat in steady even strokes and then build up the coverage gradually. The other thing to take into account is that once you have applied the coats and let it dry, the paint sweats fine particles for quite some time and it's necessary to wipe it down several times over a few days. But this will eventually stop. And the final shine that you achieve is second to none. Unfortunately, due to the filming setup, I was unable to keep the surface entirely free from dust and some contamination occurred as it was drying. In order to minimise the amount of masking applied to the metallic paint, the first step is to paint any parts of the plane that are not bare metal and then mask them off. You may wish to consider applying the varnish coats at this early stage too, removing any need for any type of masking after. The majority of bare metal aircraft subjects require two or more different shades of aluminium and you can cut some corners depending on the level of time commitment that you wish to invest. When undertaking the first coat, the best and safest course is to mask everything off as normal. However, that corner I mentioned that you can cut, well, that's what I've done here and it's simply being less thorough with the masking in the first shade of metallic paint. The overspray will always have the potential to show through. I have read different views as to how to best apply the metallizers. Some say that you should apply several thin coats as a mist if you like. In other words, not to allow too much paint to hit the surface. In my experience, this can create texture on the surface and doesn't allow the paint particles to bond to the surface properly and thus particles can start to rub off when wiped with a finger. Ideally, and as recommended by the manufacturer, I think it's best to spray the surface with a good solid burst of paint, 
However, if you don't feel fully confident in your ability to control an airbrush's paint flow, then I would recommend the following compromise. Spray with the paint flow at just over half the maximum. This would be an absolute minimum and I recommend that you build up the paint gradually. The best method however, as mentioned before, and this is not without significant risks, is to open up the throttle, both paint and air, more than normal, and with the airbrush a little further away. In metallizers, there is more carrier fluid than normal, and this evaporates much, much quicker than normal. So the high volume that's sprayed actually solidifies on the surface within seconds. If the paint particles interact when they're still in the liquid state and dry together, they form a thicker and more resilient shell. Be sure to test your airbrush first on some scrap plastic to get the right feel or be prepared to have a slightly blemished result. If you ever have to return to lay new layers on top of dried ones, you will never quite get the same shade and it will more than likely be noticeable, sometimes more than others. Make sure that you don't get too close when using the high throttle. This will cause the spiderweb pooling to occur. If it starts, immediately pull your hand away from the plane, but do not pull back on the throttle, as sometimes you can get a slight splatter if you cut the throttle too hard too fast. Granted that on the lower pressure settings, this is much less likely to occur, but it's a good procedure to keep in mind. If you do get a major error, immediately wipe it off with your finger and hope that the surrounding paint isn't too badly affected and redo the area. Do not use tissues or the like as it will contaminate the area. Bare metal finishes are the hardest of all to paint and can be quite unforgiving, but I don't want to turn you away from trying as it can also be the most rewarding. When applying the second shade of metallizers, it is very important to mask everything off, as any overspray will be visible. There is a real danger, however, that due to the tackiness of masking tape, it can pull some of the surface particles, and even whole chunks, right down to the undercoat. To be honest, I can't remember any model where this has not happened, at least in tiny amounts, and I'm not entirely sure why in some areas, the paint just doesn't stick properly. My best guess, is that it might be linked to the sweating process of the undercoat or simply not being cleaned thoroughly enough. I have found that the Tamiya White Flexible Tape performed better with regard to the tackiness but was not entirely flawless. One way to reduce the severity and likeliness of damage is to repeatedly handle the adhesive part of the tape with your hands, thereby reducing the strength of the glue but not to the point where it fails to adhere fully to the model and thereby exposing gaps. This is especially critical when masking the direct edge of any interface between the two shades. When removing the tape, take extra care and do it slowly. Pull it off as close to the model as possible. Also another issue when removing the tape that you should be conscious of is the amount of handling which may be required, as you often need a good grip on the model itself and this can lead to some fingerprint marks. Try and have the model lying down on the bench if possible. I have experimented with various gloves in the past, with some degree of protection. Latex gloves performing the best, and cotton the worst. But I think clean hands, that have been washed properly with soap, are best in terms of grip and minimizing marks. But essentially the golden rule is to handle the model as little as possible after the undercoat stage. The procedure for washing bare metal finishes is a little different than other paint schemes. This is fundamentally due to the fact that it is best to avoid any varnish on the metalizers. 
Therefore, it is absolutely critical that only water-based products are used. This of course is assuming that enamel-based metallizers were used. Due to the glossy look and general shine that you get from metallizers, I would not recommend using any pure black washes for the general wash, as the contrast will be too strong. Here I have used a custom blend of light grey and dark grey. Due to the colour corrections used in the editing process for the video, this appears to be darker on screen than in real life. It's at this point that you really appreciate the many hours spent painstakingly re-drilling all those rivets. And if you missed any, it can also be a time of regrets. One such regret I have with this build is that I didn't scrutinise the clear canopy rivets sufficiently and the detail is slightly washed out in some parts. Often there are some rivets that are under the decals and if the setting solution has failed to make the decals sink into it enough, it may need to be manually pierced to allow for the wash to get in deep enough. If you don't, you run the risk of simply wiping clean all the decals. When applying the wash, it is often necessary to go over many areas twice. The second time, once it has dried. This can also apply to panel lines, but especially to rivet holes. Make sure to keep an eye on each rivet as you go past them. As sometimes it looks like it went in, but actually a bubble forms and the wash doesn't go quite in. Make sure that all the panel and rivets are covered by the wash, because if you miss any, it will cause the eye to be drawn to the inconsistency. It is also worth noting that on the odd occasion, some of the decals may not have adhered to the model sufficiently. This ordinarily may not be a big issue, but when some liquid and brushes enter into the equation, it can dislodge them or lift up a corner. This is easily dealt with by carefully adding some varnish with a brush under the decal effectively using it as glue and thus a little care and observation at this point can save a lot of hassles in the future. Once all the wash is in place it's a simple matter of wiping off any excess with a damp cotton bud dipped in the appropriate acrylic thinner. Try and do this with strokes that are perpendicular to the panel line. Due to the angles involved in filming, I was not always able to do this and therefore I had to redo some parts. Personally, I find that bare metal finishes without any wash at all, even a subtle light grey one, just doesn't quite look right. Even if you're aiming to depict a fresh out of the factory subject, if you do no other weathering, you should at least consider doing this process. If you're using one of the brand acrylic thinners, they often contain other chemicals in them, in particular alcohol. This can leave a residue on the surface of the metalizer, which will distract from the overall finish in a significant way. The best way to clean this up, I found, is to gently wipe the area that's affected with a tissue moistened with the same thinner, then quickly wipe it down with a tissue moistened in plain water and thus wiping away any residue. Alternatively, you can wipe down any residue before it actually dries as you're doing the initial cleanup. But normally you have a very short window of opportunity and your focus is likely to be elsewhere. To add some additional weathering, black smoke pigment is used in places where grease and other grime would accumulate. Particular attention is given to the exhaust ports, at the rear of the main wing structure where the flaps join, and the gun ports. This is a precarious process, as the thinner used to liquefy the pigment is lacquer based and very quickly eats into the metal finish. It should be used very sparingly and very carefully. Trying to apply the pigment dry is almost impossible as it rubs off extremely easily and therefore is very difficult to use on the plane and especially to make it stay there.
That's all for this episode of Scale Model Cinema. I hope you enjoyed it and will join us again in the future. Check out other videos at scalemodelcinema.com or like us on Facebook.